Antonio Egas Moniz, Portuguese neurologist, inventor of brain surgery for mental illness, awarded the Nobel Prize in 1949. But was he a true pioneer to be lauded and celebrated, or a self-serving narcissist concerned only with his own glory? I'm Professor Graeme Austin, and today I'm going to be exploring the life and work of one of the most controversial figures in psychiatry, Antonio Egas Moniz, trying to work out if he was a hero or a villain. Moniz was born in a small town near Oporto in Portugal in 1874. His uncle persuaded his family to change his surname to Egas Moniz, as he was convinced that the family was descended from a 12th century Portuguese nobleman who was a hero in the struggle against the Moors. He studied medicine at the University of Coimbra and developed an early interest in psychological issues, completing his doctoral thesis on human sexuality. He expanded this and published it as A Vida Sexual, or Sexual Life, in two volumes in 1901. Written in accessible language with little use of Latin, it was an immediate success and over the next 30 years it reached 19 editions and sold over 30,000 copies until 1933, when the increasingly repressive Portuguese government prohibited further print runs and restricted its sale to pharmacies and required those wishing to consult it at public libraries to state their reasons for doing so. His ideas on sexuality very much reflect the prevailing medical views in Europe at this time, pathologizing any behaviour that was not connected to procreation, especially in women. For example, he said in relation to masturbation in women, girls with morbid tendencies such as virgin's melancholia or hysteria should be married off at the earliest opportunity. Pretty old school now, I'm sure you'll agree, but this wouldn't have raised too many eyebrows of the stuffed shirts of 1901. Besides medicine, Moniz was also interested in politics and as a student, he was jailed on two separate occasions for participating in Republican demonstrations. He formed his own centre-ground party and was elected to Parliament in 1900. In 1902, he went to France to study neurology and psychiatry, which were much more closely linked disciplines in those days. First in Bordeaux, then in Paris, working with Joseph Babinski and others at the famous Salpetriere and Pitié hospitals. After a year, he returned to Coimbra as a lecturer in anatomy and pathology and continued to pursue his interest in politics. It was a turbulent time in Portugal and following the assassination of King Carlos I and his eldest son in 1908, Moniz was arrested and imprisoned for 10 days as a known Republican. The throne passed to the king's younger son, Manuel II, but the new king was overthrown in 1910 and the monarchy abolished. In 1911, the forward-thinking Republican government created a new University of Lisbon and Moniz was appointed its first Professor of Neurology, remaining in post until his retirement in 1944. And his statue, wearing his rather odd professorial robes, still stands proudly in front of the medical faculty to this day. During the First World War, he was made ambassador to Spain and later, after Portugal joined the Allies against Germany, he became Minister for Foreign Affairs. In 1919, he led the Portuguese delegation to the Versailles Peace Conference, and his signature appears on the peace treaty, formally ending hostilities. Back in Portugal, President Sidonio Pais was assassinated by left-wing activist José de Costa, who was then locked away in a psychiatric hospital until he died 28 years later, never having gone to trial. Exhausted, and demoralised by the conflicts and compromises of power, Moniz retired from politics in 1919 and returned to full-time medicine. He published research on a wide variety of subjects, including neurological injuries in soldiers, the treatment of diphtheria, alcoholism, psychoanalysis, necrophilia, and the bizarre epidemic of encephalitis lethargica that killed as many as half a million people in the 1920s and remains unexplained to this day. Moniz was a prolific writer and also published work on non-medical topics including Portuguese literature, the portrayal of madness in art and the history of playing cards as he was a keen gambler. 
His main contribution to medicine, although not the one that won him the Nobel Prize, was the invention of a technique for localising brain tumours and other lesions by visualising the blood vessels in the brain with x-rays. He experimented by injecting radiopaque dyes directly into the arteries supplying the brains of animals and cadavers, and then taking x-rays to see what he could see. He was then ready to move on to live subjects, patients with suspected tumours, epilepsy and Parkinsonism. His initial tests using strontium and lithium bromide failed, partly because the solutions were too dense and partly because the needle missed its target, the carotid artery. As a result, one patient lost the ability to speak and another died. Undeterred, Monis continued experimenting. He improved his injection technique by getting a surgeon to expose the carotid artery and used a sodium iodide solution. This time he was successful. He created the world's first cerebral angiogram. It may not seem much now when we have so many ways of seeing what's going on in a person's brain, but it was a big step forward at the time, as the previous technique for visualising the brain, the pneumoencephalogram, or AIR study, created by draining the cerebrospinal fluid that surrounds the brain by lumbar puncture and injecting air in its place, was extremely painful and yielded imprecise images of peripheral structures only. Monis presented his findings in Paris in 1927 and continued to work on refining the technique, delivering dozens of lectures and papers on the subject all around the world, even speaking on the radio. His technique was widely adopted and dramatically improved the ability of surgeons to deal with brain tumours and he was twice nominated for the Nobel Prize for this work. He also contributed to the development of the radioactive thorium dye Thorotrast, which was widely used in the investigations of millions of patients for over 20 years before it eventually emerged that it was actually very toxic and caused leukaemia and other cancers. The innovation for which he was actually awarded the Nobel Prize is much more controversial. Prefrontal leukotomy, surgically cutting or destroying the connections of the frontal lobe to the rest of the brain as a treatment for severe mental illness. Moniz wasn't the first to come up with the idea of psychosurgery. This honour, if you can call it that, is usually given to Swiss psychiatrist Gottlieb Burkhardt, who operated on six patients in 1888 most of whom were delusional and aggressive. With primitive instruments and no proper operating theatre, Burkhardt cut out strips of cerebral cortex up to four times in each patient in a technique he called topectomy. Four patients developed serious side effects and one died in status epilepticus five days after surgery, but three patients improved, being described as quieter. Burkhardt presented his work in Berlin and his findings were reported in medical journals in several other countries, but the reception was largely negative and critical of the theoretical underpinnings of his work, the brevity of his follow-up and the side effects suffered by the patients. Although Burkhardt's work was largely forgotten and psychological approaches to mental disorder became all the rage, Moniz firmly held on to the biological explanations of mental illness that dominated psychiatric thinking in the 19th century as he had seen for himself the personality and behavioural changes in soldiers who had sustained head injuries in the war. He believed that mental illness arose from a fixation of synapses in the frontal lobe which led to predominant obsessive ideas. He had been considering surgical options for several years, but it was hearing about the experiments of Yale physiologists John Fulton and Carlisle Jacobson on primates at a conference in London in 1935 that spurred him on. They reported that removing the frontal lobes of chimpanzees made them calmer and more cooperative, and Monintz announced to the audience, they are just like my patients, I think this might be done in man. Monintz was 61 years old and had deformities and limited movement in his hands as a result of gout, so he called on his neurosurgical colleague Pedro Almeida Lima to try the procedure on a group of 20 patients with long-term severe mental illnesses. The surgery was conducted under general anaesthesia with Lima as the surgeon, but Moniz standing beside him telling him exactly what to do. 
The first operation was performed in November 1935 on a 63-year-old woman with depression, anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations and insomnia. Lima injected pure alcohol into the patient's brain to destroy her frontal lobes under the guidance of Moniz. Yes, I know this sounds more like Jeffrey Dahmer than the actions of a Nobel laureate, but that's what they did. And then they waited. Somehow she made a rapid recovery and two months later a psychiatrist noted that she was calmer, less paranoid and well oriented. Nine other surgeries were performed using alcohol to destroy brain tissue before they developed a new technique using a leukotome, a needle-like instrument with a retractable wire loop which was designed to cut the white matter fibres connecting the frontal lobe to other parts of the brain when it was rotated. Of the first 20 patients, Moniz reported seven cures, seven improvements and six unchanged cases. But no deaths and no patients made worse. All undesirable effects were said to have been temporary. Vomiting, incontinence, apathy, disorientation and abnormal sensations of hunger. He presented his results in Paris in March 1936 just four months after the operations began. And over the next few years, he published over a hundred scientific papers in French, English, German and Italian journals, claiming prefrontal leukotomy is a simple operation, always safe, which may prove to be an effective surgical treatment in certain cases of mental disorder. He also claimed that any behavioural or personality deterioration that might occur was outweighed by a reduction in the debilitating effects of the illness, although he did concede that patients who had already deteriorated from their mental illness did not benefit much from the procedure. By a grim irony, Moniz was shot eight times by a patient with schizophrenia in 1939 and five bullets hit him in the right hand, chest and spine. Three bullets were removed but one was lodged in his spine. However, despite the seriousness of the injuries, he made a complete recovery. Interestingly, most English language biographical pieces in medical journals about Moniz say the date of the attack was 1949 and that he had to use a wheelchair for the rest of his life and that the patient was someone who had previously undergone a leukotomy, all of which are wrong. His leukotomy procedure caught on rapidly and in the US it was adapted by Walter Freeman and James Watts, both of whom corresponded with Moniz. They changed the name to lobotomy, and by 1941 a US newspaper article reported the revolutionary new brain operation, and declared that many patients who underwent the procedure were transformed from being problems to their family and nuisances to themselves into useful members of society. In the same year, the Journal of the American Medical Association published a panel discussion between Freeman and doctors from other states who were experimenting with the procedure. Freeman himself admitted that based on his experience of 80 cases, some had died and amongst many other complications, the personality of patients was bleached by lobotomy. It was very clear that in many cases, the undesirable side effects were neither minor nor temporary. One of Freeman's most infamous cases was Rosemary Kennedy, younger sister of President John F. Kennedy, who went from being a happy, vivacious young woman to being unable to speak or walk. If you'd like to hear more about her tragic story, please check out my video on Rosemary's lobotomy. Despite the deaths and poor outcomes, there were enough patients who were made quieter or less troublesome for the operation to become standard practice in mental hospitals around the world. 20,000 in the US alone in the 1940s and early 50s. It's hard to believe now, but it was thought of as a wonder cure at the time, and people queued up to have the procedure carried out. So in 1949, Moniz was awarded the Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discovery of the therapeutic value of leukotomy in certain psychoses. It was the pinnacle of his achievement, the ultimate accolade for a doctor trying to advance his field. But within a few years, the procedure became redundant with the introduction of antipsychotic medication in 1952. Or rather, it should have become redundant. In 
Walter Freeman, described by one writer as the most scorned physician of the 20th century after Nazi doctor Joseph Mengele, continued performing his theatrical ice pick lobotomies on adults and children as young as four, never wearing gloves or a mask and long after the introduction of effective medication, until he was finally banned from killing any more patients in 1967. Moniz continued working as a neurologist in Portugal until his death at the age of 81 in 1955. His legacy has suffered as the perception of leucotomies has changed from being the miracle cures they were initially thought to be to one of the most barbaric medical treatments ever devised. Moniz has been criticised for providing inadequate documentation, understating the severity of complications and for not following up his patients long enough to truly determine the efficacy of his treatment. There have even been calls to revoke Moniz's Nobel Prize from the families of those who underwent leucotomies. Others, however, have defended Moniz and stressed the importance of examining his work in its historical context. It came at a time of overcrowding and underfunding in institutions around the world and increasingly vocal demands for the economically unproductive to be sterilised or euthanized, demands which led to the Nazi Axion Tifia extermination program in Germany, which murdered 300,000 mentally ill and learning disabled adults and children. If Moniz's work helped quell these demands in other countries long enough to allow a more effective treatment to be developed, then surely it must have been a good thing. In his native Portugal, Moniz is highly regarded. He featured on banknotes and postage stamps and he was even offered the Presidency of the Republic in 1951. But how should we regard him in the 21st century? Was he a pioneer of psychiatry to be lauded and celebrated, or a self-serving narcissist concerned only with his own glory? A hero or a villain? My view is that he was a bit of both. Although medical research ethics and scientific methodology were nowhere near as well developed then as they are now, he could and should have done much better at recording his subject's clinical characteristics before and after their surgery. He should also have followed them up properly and for a much longer period before presenting his findings. I think he was well aware that others were thinking about the same kind of procedure and he wanted to be the first to press. I agree with this review of Moniz's early results which appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1937, calling for more data. But then, as now, people don't always listen to those advising caution. But I do also think that Moniz was a pioneer. Pioneers sometimes go down dark and dangerous paths, and Moniz did exactly that. Thanks to Moniz, we now know that the path he discovered is one that should be closed off forever. I know I probably won't convince all of you to cross him off the evil doctor list, but I do believe that Moniz was honestly trying to improve the lives of people for whom years of institutional care and premature death was all they had to look forward to. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and click the notifications bell if you want to be kept up to date with all the latest videos. See you next time.